Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Hey, Bill, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to be here. Man, it's great to have you on. Great to have you on. And, and what a unique privilege we have because you have uh, you know, a skill set that many of us need, but few of us understand. So if you can just kind of give us a, a brief overview, and we're, you know, we're talking about cost segregation today, uh, yeah. especially as it pertains to larger assets. And I know that there's maybe if we have time, we'll get into the smaller asset classes. But what is cost segregation? How does it work? I mean, just give us the down and dirty on what this process looks like. Okay, essentially cost segregation is a way to optimize your depreciation schedule. So, you know, you buy an asset and it depreciates over time. And okay. typically our goal is to buy real estate that's unappreciating assets. So it actually appreciates in value, like that classic car you buy and tell your wife about, right? Eh, it's an investment, baby. Right? You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> you just burn through a lot of you know, rubber and tires. But anyway, so you get to depreciate this asset. So what cost segregation does is it takes that asset and we essentially dissect it into all its component parts. So we break it down into each component part and then assign a life to those component parts because the IRS allows a different life class for structural components or 27 and a half year for multifamily, right? right? Your walls, your roof, your HVAC, doors, windows, things like that, structural bathrooms. Then there's, you know, land improvements, your exterior components, you know, those are land improvements which follow a 15 year life, you know, landscaping, sidewalks, parking, tot lots, swimming pool, you know, whatever you've got in your multifamily community, security lights, fencing, et cetera. And then you've got your interior improvements, which become personal property, which are a five-year class. And there's some seven-year class as far as phone line hookups, and they're still in systems, but most people just use cell phones these days. But those are specialty flooring, hookups for your appliances, your appliances, special lighting, ceiling fans, washer dryer hookups and vents and things like that. So those things have a shorter life. Well, you know, they may actually last 27 and a half years, like a plug, it still allows you to re So when we reassign or reclassify that asset with that life, you get deductions up front, which increases your depreciation, which allows you to take greater deductions, you pay less taxes, you have more cash to buy more real estate. That's kind of the goal. And then the other thing that a lot of people are hearing about now is 100% bonus depreciation. Okay, we get it like, everyone thinks, oh, good, I get double 100% bonus, so I get extra depreciation. No, the IRS doesn't allow you to double dip, but what 100% depreciation means, and right now it's effective through the end of 2022, is all that short life components, that 15, seven, and five year components that we identify, you can then take in year one. So you get all that deduction up front. You can take 100% of it. 100% of your short life, of your accelerator, anything less than 20 years. So that's what 100% means. It doesn't mean you get extra. So it's a bonus. The bonus is, let's say it's a $10 million property. We identify 35%. That's $3.5 million. You can take that up your front in year one. You'll say, oh my gosh, that's more than I need. Well, in a syndication, it's a pass-through, right, to the passive investors. Proportionally, they all get their deductions. But that property might not make that money. It's right. still your depreciation. It carries forward as NOL law. So you don't lose it. I talk to people, they go, but if I, if I don't use it, what happens to it? It's like, it's yours. It's a carry forward NOL loss. So, and then you just have it next year. So you don't pay rent on this property for many years to come. So that's really what depreciation is and the bonus kind of, there's a misnomer about that or it's a misunderstanding, but it just allows you to take all that short life components, all that deductions in year one but it carries forward. So, you know, you don't lose it if you don't use it. Right. And so let's, let, let, let's, if we can, um, kind of, let's see if I can re-clarify that. So you've got your normal cost segregation, which defines all of these items, whether it be the 27 and a half, 15, seven, five year items. Mm -hmm. But right now we've got a special opportunity with hundred percent bonus depreciation on anything under 20 years. So it's three, like on this $10 million property, if you get three and a half million, then that is a three and a half million dollar basically write off that we have against our income. That's correct. And so if the property makes a million dollars this year, we still have two and a half million more that we can take next year. 
That's right. Now, you, you'll show a two and a half million dollar loss, but you'll still make money, and everybody, the investors, still get paid their their dividends. So that's it's that's all good. So you everybody gets paid, but you show a loss. Right. I'm curious, and and, and I know that, that I'm asking a question that probably everyone wants to know, uh, and maybe there's no good answer for. But why in the world would this? Why would they do that? Why would the government come out and say, "All right, we're going to do this"? Like what? What benefit? Well, 100% bonus came out with the Tax Cuts Jobs Act. So okay. we're going through this economic stuff and bonus depreciation has been allowed several times to spur and instill the economy. Gotcha. Um, real estate is a big part of the economy. We had 100% sure. bonus back in like the early 2000s. We've had 50% a few times. It's just an incentive that came out with the Tax Cuts Jobs Act, which will expire. And so, you know, there's a chance a new administration might change that. Can they get it done this year? Who knows? But, you know, some people are just racing to the door to kind of get this done. Um, but it's got to go through Ways and Means Committee and there's old tax stuff. So it's not just, you know, a pen and a phone to kind of change that. But they do that to instill this. Now, they're still going to get the money. They're still going to be taxed on that at some point. It's just giving the opportunity to, you know, invest more. So it really hopefully it spurs more investment. Again, with paying less taxes, you have more cash flow. So it's a cash flow to one, revitalize your property but usually people buy and they set aside those funds or two, you know, reinvest in your company. If you're you know, not a multi-company investor, but you're buying your own building or three, buy more real estate. So you can again, continue to buy more real estate. Right. Right. That's interesting. That's interesting. Well, that's something certainly to keep in mind. Uh, he knows we move forward and look at things that, 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 uh, that that's something that's available. Let's zoom out a little bit if we can, because I know that was kind of a, a very specific uh, item that we were covering there, but let's zoom out on the cost segregation process. If I come to you and I say, Hey, Bill, I've got this property. Um, is this something you want to do before you close? Is this something you want to do after you close? What, when, when is an ideal time for an investor to come to you and say, I want to do a cost segregation study? Well, I would say any time, but when you're about to close, um, that's a great time. I get a lot of investors say, hey, I got this property. I want to evaluate the tax benefits associated with that. Some people are familiar and they'll say, just take a rough percentage. They don't really put it in their you know, offering memorandum, but they, you know, they, they understand the cost segregation. Right. So a lot of times I'll do a proposal up front or once they close. So there's a thing where you, you do it in service and, and many of your listeners probably are doing value add properties. Mm -hmm. They're going to buy a property and they're going to put some money into it. So having asset detail and disposition abandonment, which is an expense, which when you get rid of something and throw it out, then you can expense that versus leaving it on your property as a ghost asset when you put new stuff on. Right. So, so usually we do it when people acquire the property, the year in service, you just need to do it. For example, I've got people now that are bought properties in 2020 and they're like, wait, I need to do it now, but I, you know, I missed the year end. It's like, doesn't matter. We just need to do it before you file taxes. Got it. You don't have to do your 2020. We don't have to finish by 1231. We just have to finish. If you extend to, you know, October, we just have to finish it before you file your taxes to get to your CPA. So that's one of the misnomers out there. So, but what happens is you do it, you might have never realized this and you bought a property two years ago and say, wow, I never heard about this before. Right. Well, our firm and any other firm does what we call a look back study. We can say, well, you've taken straight line for since 18 and 19. So for 20, now we're going to do cost seg. So we go back and we do a study, break it all down, you know, itemize, find your results. 2018 was a 100% bonus year. It started uh, September 28th, 2017. So anything from that date on forward qualifies for 100% bonus. So we did the study. And it just catches up. There's lost opportunity, but you've taken straight line. Right, and the right. CPA needs to do a form or we can have that done. What's called the 3115 change of accounting method. It just tells the IRS, hey, I used to be straight line. Now I'm component level depreciation. And it's an automatic approval. They fill it out. And actually, once you do that or get your cost seg, your next estimated taxes are changed. Some people think, well, I can't benefit till next April, or I'm just not going to do it till year end. It's like, well, everybody rushes to the door then. It's like, no, if you do it now for 2021, an acquisition from January 3rd, your March 15th, your June 15th, September, those estimators are reduced. So your cash flow, <clears throat> not immediate, but it's kind of quarterly. So, you know, that's another misnomer people don't realize about cost sake. So we can do it, you know, Years after you bought it, we can do it, you know, 
before, but but how the process works for us and pretty much anyone else is we do a feasibility analysis. It's a nice way to say proposal. Right, we'll look right. at the property. We get your details. We'll analyze it, analyze your improvements, and then we'll uh, assess that and come back with a, a proposal of and the tax benefits and the projections, you know, conservative and optimistic. We don't know until we get there because there's a lot of methods and materials that make a big difference. So it's not just, well, it's always 22% or it's always 43% or it's always 30 It depends. Some properties are just the circumstances around that, the methods and materials that builders and developers use make a difference in the tax efficiency, as we call it. So we come back with an estimate and you say, let's go. And then we inspect the property, do all the details and you get your final report, you know, 60 days later, for example. Right, right. That's going to be one of my questions is how long does a study like this take? But it sounds like 60 days-ish. It's about 60 days. Some people are shorter. They do a modeling and residual methods. They don't go into the level of engineering. We do a lot of engineering. Then we have to build a big report. So it takes some time. And actually, we've it's taken a little longer because of COVID and travel restrictions and all the things. But, you know, in and about 60 days, you know, and usually then we'll give you the preliminary results, which you can use to file taxes. Then we assemble a huge report, a report, PDF, multi-tabbed, all the details. And that's essentially your audit defense. And we also give you all the asset details. So for future abandonment and disposition, as I mentioned that earlier, if you're not familiar with that, that means, for example, you tear off a roof and it had some life value left on it. People throw it in the uh, landfill, you know, put it in a dumpster, hop to the landfill. Well, this still had $10,000 worth of value on your depreciation schedule. You've just thrown away, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a $10,000 expense, you know, you could take. And then you have ghost set because then you put a new forty thousand or sixty thousand dollar roof on, so now your roof is overvalued by that ten thousand. So you want to be able to abandon, dispose of that, take that expense, which is good, and then put the new roof on, and so you don't have what we call ghost assets. That sounds. Um, I don't know how else to say this, but nitty gritty. Like, you know, there's a lot of things for us as investors that we have to pay attention to. So how does how does an investor stay on top of things like that? I mean, are they constantly in touch with you? Because, I mean, those are things I would have never thought about. Oh, well, hey, well, life left well, in the roof. Well, once you get the details to CPA, hopefully your CPA will do it. But I have people to call me and say, hey, we've got these improvement plans. And sometimes we'll get a job where we bought it in 18 and they did all some improvements in 19 and 20. And now we go and do the study. And so we'll go and do the study on the original acquisition. And then there was $600,000 worth of improvements. So then we got to, that's different. Maybe it happened in 18 and 19. So it's different tax years, different depreciation schedules. And once we've done both, then we can say, hmm, all that stuff you tore out, we can define, we can identify as disposition or abandonment expense. So we do that a lot. And then you get, and that's an expense, which is better depreciation. But yeah. in many cases, for example, you're doing just carpets and maybe countertops and things like that. That's five year property. So with bonus depreciation, you've essentially already disposed of that. So unless you're doing structural things, you know, 27 and a half a year in those, this position is not as big a deal with bonus depreciation. When we didn't have that, our, our extreme asset detail was very valuable. But once you've written it off because it's already five year property, you've already disposed of it. So that doesn't really matter. So right. it doesn't matter for both. But we talk to CPAs, we talk to the investors, and hey, what do you've got? I've got people to buy property, go and do all these improvements this year. And I say, well, well, do the cost seg now. Just give us your list of improvements, what you've done. And we can just go down the list and give you a life class. And your CPA just books it in your depreciation schedule. You don't even really need depreciation for that. So Gotcha. We work with our clients for that purpose. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure I'm sure you do a lot of coaching uh, along the way and even explaining what it is that you do cuz cuz even even uh being in the business I would I would get overwhelmed probably and have a lot of questions along the way. What does someone budget? I know every project's different, but is there is there a kind of a, a round number like on a per million, you know, asset cost or how does someone say, "Hey, this is something I'm building in to do a cost segregation study?" You know, it's hard to do that. Some people have somewhat fixed fees. Most of our studies, a true study, would fall between the five and ten thousand dollar range. It just depends on the asset and things. So, if you have a single floor plan, because we have to look at each floor plan sure. and count every outlet, count everything in there, and break that up. But if you've got then two hundred units of that floor plan, and you've got four hundred units, and it's only two floor plans, then that's fairly easy to do. Sure. Seventeen floor plans were like. There's a lot more work to do. So it really depends on the engineering. So we evaluate each job 
by the engineering hours that it takes. Right. But generally, those you know are, they range between you know five and ten thousand dollars for most studies. Even huge, you know, sixty million dollar towers might be you know twelve thousand. You think, well, that's huge, and the benefits are ginormous. But if we could you know charge on a percent, we would, we could, <laughs> we make more money. But it's basically an engineering hour. So some of those are, you know, I mean, a, a two million dollar property might be about the same price as an eight to 10 or $12 million property. I mean, right. the, the proportionate rate doesn't go up because there's so much engineering that, good that goes into a project regardless of size. Right. And that's, that, that seems uh, like a no brainer. I mean, why, why isn't everybody out, you know, getting cost segregation studies down if it's, I mean, if it's under, under 20 grand and you're, you're talking millions in, uh, in, in stuff that you can write off, like what? Well, the well they are. They are, but we're saying right. And some some people don't even know about it. You'd be surprised. These huge companies that I call, they go, I never knew about this. You know, guys buying, you know, 20 shopping malls and huge, you know, these huge centers we've done. They had no idea about it. And then the small investors, some of these guys that you're working with and your clients that are buying five and eight and ten million dollar projects, you know, apartment multifamily, whether individually or syndicated, they're pretty savvy about it because they want to be a real estate professional. That's the other thing where this depreciation is a passive activity. So if you're not a real estate professional, it offsets passive income. So you have to have those passive incomes that can offset any of the rent you've got. That's why so many people are becoming real estate professionals or you have a high earner and a spouse. The spouse says, I'll get a real estate professional. So you can offset that passive activity against ordinary income. Right. And that's, that's the golden ticket for people. That's what I work with every day. Interesting. And, and is this, do you think the lack of um, familiarity with this subject is just because, you know, the CPAs just don't know anything about it or wh- why, did, why is this not more widely discussed? Well, um, you know, I'm not really sure. CPAs, it depends, are, are savvy about it. Some and some are not. Some is, oh, yeah, they have a misperception from years ago or it's too expensive, doesn't pay back. It's, uh, you know, it just depends on the CPA. But right. a lot of CPAs, don't, they're not experts in this. I mean, CPAs, they might even be a tax CPA, but they deal with the software and the over, they're more like an auditor. I mean, right. you know, I talk to CPAs all the time. We work with CPAs because I don't want to do this. I'm going to sure. call Bill. They see our report and go, this is CYA. We use you guys. So we educate a lot of CPAs and some are very active people like Brant, Brandon Hall and his, he's a real estate CPA. So he's very active in this stuff. And some are just our CPAs and our client buys a little real estate. You know, I talked, I usually talk to the owners and then they introduce me to the CPA. So right, right, right. we educate the CPA. A lot of them don't really, it's not their fault. They have, you know, tons of other stuff to know. We oh specialize goodness. in this segment. I mean, that's what we do. Right. No, that's fantastic. Uh, let's let's briefly, if we can, switch gears and go from the large asset class to the smaller asset class is classes. Is this something that we can do on single family rentals on you know one to four unit multifamily? I mean, is there no is there an end to what we can do a cost segregation study on? Sometimes you know if it's too old of a property, too old of ownership. Doesn't matter the age of the property because when you buy it, you get the depreciation schedule starts from day one that you buy it, even if it's built in the twenties. Right? Sure. But we do a lot of multi or one to four family single families. I was working with an investor the other day, and he did a fifty eight thousand dollars single family in upstate New York. You know, up on the Erie Canal, a little town up there, and he's like, "Hey, I buy these smaller properties. Does it make sense?" ELB Consulting has a division called DIY Cost Seg. It's like do it yourself, but it's really do it yourself. You just input the core data and then it comes back and does a modeling like a lot of our competitors use modeling, but use the modeling calculation. It comes back and gives you a quick and easy five minute low cost alternative. It will go up to a million dollars on residential one to four. And then if it's a five plus unit, it becomes a commercial property and they're, you know, more expensive, but you know, with my discount, you know, it's like $640. And so there's a lot of talk about those like on bigger pockets and things and, oh, no auto defense and things like that. It's like we calculate it. It's more conservative because we're not inspecting the property. It's going to air conservative. Right. But if there's ever an audit, we fully defend it and we're going to send an engineer out to that property 
and inspect it and break out every single component as we would with that $7,000 study on the, you know, $5 million multifamily. So, you know, you're protected completely, but it's quick, it's easy. You know, I do a portfolio of homes all the time and we also do commercial. We do any type of commercial. We can actually go up to $3 million on that. But what you don't get is all that asset detail and all those things, which there's properties under a million that makes sense to get the full study. So I counsel people say, what are your needs? What are your goals? It's brand new. It's really good to, you know, go with the low cost. You don't need all that detail, but sometimes they need that because there's going to be a lot of value add. So I talk to the folks and say, here's the cost benefit analysis. Maybe there's a $4,000 difference, but if you get 50,000 more in deductions, that might be worth it, right? Yeah. What, what's the value for deduction? If you're a real estate professional, it's worth it. If you're passive and you just, you know, it's just, it may not be worth it. So again, I, I ask them about their, their class of um, how they can use the depreciation. Because if you can't use it, some people straight line might be fine. You know, it might meet their needs. But, right. you know, depreciation, it's a really a, a tool that's used pretty heavily in the industry. But still, yeah. a lot of people are unaware. Right. And so that's a tool that we can actually just go to your website and use. Yeah. You go to my, our website, it's uh, DIYCostSeg.com, And I've got a discount code I can share right now. It's 1200. It saves $50 off a of residential. And, uh, but uh, you know, I would ask people to call me and then I, I step them through it. Usually step through the first one, you pay online using PayPal or credit card and it's done in 10 minutes. So that's yeah, that's nice. very easy. We have a lot of people coming to that. It's really picked up. We, Introduced that about two and a half years ago, you know, after 15,000 studies and all the historical data and things, we basically built a modeling system. Right. So, so a doctor's office, a convenience store, a self-storage, is it conditioned self-storage, non-conditioned self-storage? We have every, we have so many classifications of property, warehouse, flex property, lots of office, less office, because that all makes a difference in the results of the cost seg study. Right. Right. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. I will be uh, on your website checking that out. That's for sure. Bill, uh, if you were to take everything you know about cost segregation and give one one thing you say you have to do this as it pertains to cost seg, what would that one thing be? The one thing, to, well, the one thing is to, when you buy property, evaluate it, determine that it's going to give you value evaluate and, and compare, you know, look at a couple of options, look at what people price it at and look at what your benefits will be. I mean, everyone gives a range and, you know, our company and everyone else says, here's a range. Um, but are they going to meet that range? You know, we like to under promise over deliver, but really is give it a fair shake. Some people are like, well, I don't know, or there's going to be, um, you know, uh, recapture rate. You've probably heard of that. You know what I'm talking about there? Mm-mm, I do not. So recapture is one of the things that people say, oh, my gosh, I don't do cost because there's recapture rate. So oh. once you pay that depreciation, you have to pay taxes on that excess rate. Well, the chances are ordinary or capital gains rate is going to go up to ordinary income tax rate here pretty soon. And that kind of eliminates that argument. So if you're if you're flipping properties, it doesn't really make sense. If you've got a three to five year hold, that's what it makes, or even a long term hold. Like people say, I'm going to hold this price as a family legacy property. We're going to hold it for 20 years, maybe, or it's my business. It's like, is are you ever going to do any upgrades to it? Well, yeah, you know, in five, 10 years, you got new flooring and this, you got to pay, you got to keep up with the other, you know, doctor's offices and keep up with the Joneses to get more clients in, right? So yeah, you want to do cost segregation. So you always, the biggest takeaway is look into it and see if it works for you. I mean, that's the key thing. It's, does it work for you and your tax? Because it's always about the tax situation. Right, right, right. That's awesome. What uh, What's one thing you're currently doing to stay on top of your game? One thing I got you guys surprise question. Actually, you know, they, they, they were in the podcast guest guide. Oh, well, I, I read that, right. But I, 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 didn't, <laughs> I didn't plan for that. I kind of read it the other day. So, yeah. I'm just giving you grief. Thanks for coming on, Bill. I'm sorry. I couldn't help no, it. No, no, that's good. So, I, you know, I, I try to, you know, eat right, stay healthy. It's the first of the year, of course, but just you know, I, I do podcasts like this. Right. I read every day. I write the blogs for our website. It'll be, you know, costseg.com. There's a lot of blogs out there. I, you know, I'm fairly active on LinkedIn. There's people that are way more active than me in our industry, but I, I try to 
but just keeping in touch with with the investor pool and the investors as I like to work with the investors. Yeah, I mean, and, 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 and writing your blog posts and things like that, I'm sure you're always learning even as your own, you know, divulging what's already in your head. I'm sure you learn learn as you go. Absolutely. I mean, there was a big tax code thing that came out the other day, um, which I put a blog on and it like went crazy. It extended the energy tax credits, which, you know, are, are different than cost seg. But I mean, I, you know, it, it, it got a lot of looks really quick. I was surprised, you know, I'm not like looking for looks and likes and that kind of stuff, but it's like, okay, had saw some activities. So I put on LinkedIn and people linked and they can read more. And so Right. And I try to do, we edge educational stuff. I mean, it's not like, you know, stump preaching and chest beating. It's more, you know, what's educational. So I learn and I read other people's blogs. I learn from those. I go, oh yeah, that's a good idea. You know? Right. Right. And I listen okay. to other people's podcasts. I'm sure listen to mine and, you know, we all do the same thing and I believe in co opetition So. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. The, uh, the third question this is, this is part of the final four we always ask. So the third question is when it comes to investing in the world, what's one thing you're doing to make the world a better place? Thank you, you know, I, I like to give back a lot. We, we do a lot through our church. We do a lot through other entities and, you know, some of the community here in the community, the, the Durham food banks and things like that. I like to do a lot of that. So I like to give back and help. Everybody's locked up right now. So it's kind of, it's hard to give back. Right. But, it is. Uh, it is. And we've seen a lot of that. A lot of those, those um, charitable organizations suffering uh, just, just because that, that is becoming harder, um, unfortunately. But no, that's fantastic. Bill, if our listeners want to get in touch with you, uh, how do we do that? You can reach me at bill at elbcostseg.com. That's bill at elbcostseg.com. You can find me on LinkedIn, Bill Smith. If There might be one other one on there, but <laughs> if you put ELB, people will find me pretty quick. So I'm on LinkedIn. And then uh, my phone number in Raleigh is 919-858-6140. That's 919-858-6140. I do work all across the country. I spent many years in Arizona. My cell phone still Arizona call. So I do a lot of West Coast clients. I do work in Florida. I mean, we, we, we do work everywhere. So I'm not like, you know, confined to Raleigh, North Carolina. I work with a lot of investors that are all over the country. Right. That's awesome. Bill, thanks so much for your time today. I certainly appreciate it. This was super informative and educational. Thank you, Sam. I appreciate being on your show.